like to welcome everyone to my class tonight. This is my first time um, doing a virtual class with RUM. Um, not my first time teaching RUM. I'm actually an ex-RUM chancellor. Um, so please um, bear with me a little bit. I do have a script to go off of. Hopefully I will try to make it not too much me reading and boring everyone and putting everyone to sleep. Um, but I am a little bit more used to doing hands-on workshops, hence why I wanted to do some slides to hopefully keep people a little bit more entertained. Um, if you don't already have a glass of something to uh, enjoy while we have class tonight, feel free, go grab one. I, I definitely am drinking one of our examples tonight. Um, and hopefully, because I did not mark on my wonderful piece of paper when to turn the next slide. So bear with me. Um, so tonight's class topic is a great gateway for those who'd like to get their hands a bit wet. Um, I am not normally a punny individual. For some reason, I went a little punny with tonight's class. Um, so it's a way to get your hands a bit wet with medieval beverages and brewing. Um, I wanted to throw in a little bit of history without, like I said, putting everyone to sleep. And I do have recipes for those people who would like to start brewing something tomorrow. Um, and also to bring a little medieval authenticity to their holiday celebrations, um, as well as to enjoy at colder events. These drinks do almost all of them make fabulous gifts for loved ones. There's two that don't make such great ones. Um, and they're good for gifts for people that are both close and far away. Some you can mail, some you'd have to drop off on doorsteps. As long as I time this right, I should have time towards the end for some question and answering. Um, however, if you have questions, Oswin, correct me if they're wrong. There should be a little chat down somewhere where people can put in their questions. I can't see it because of my screen, which I'm sharing. Yes, um, there's a chat, and I will pull that up and interrupt you with questions as they occur. Awesome. And I will also, if not, if it's not a great time, I'll try to hit them all at the end as well, and I'll include the answers to those in the PowerPoint when I send it to Oswin to upload <laughs> for the RUM documents. Um, there's a lot of people in here who I don't know. So this is kind of special. Whenever I teach at Pensac or anything, I like to give a little bit about who I am um, because other than the mass amounts of booze behind me, you guys don't know who I am. Um, in the SCA, I'm known as Baroness Verena Entworth and I've been in the SCA since I was really young. I was raised in Sanagua in the West Kingdom I moved to Calentier, where I blame or credit, depending on how you would like to take it, Master David Friedrich, uh, for starting my love of brewing back in AS39. Please don't do the math. My brewing can legally drive. Um, I have been faithfully brewing throughout the known world, and I started Midrealm Brewers Facebook group in 2015 as a way to help grow the Midrealm Brewers and for a little bit of world domination. That will come in a little bit later, I promise. Um, if you are not a member, no matter where you live, I highly recommend joining our Midrealm Brewers group, um, and I think I have a link to that a little bit later. Um, we are a fun, oh, actually, I think that's C, learning when to turn the slides. Um, we're a fun bunch of individuals, and we're also there to help grow brewers across the known world, not just in the Middle Kingdom. Um, being a brewer in the SCA, in my opinion, is one of the toughest arts to do due to not being able to necessarily have drinks at events and rules and regulations. And because of that, I started the Drunken Duck um, as a place to get brewers to be able to gather um, at events and share their arts in a more historical setting. Um, I tried to bring a little bit of that tonight to the class. If I failed miserably, I apologize. Um, and let me move my cat off my lap. That'll probably happen a lot. So speaking a little bit of historical ambiance, I want everyone to sit back and relax and imagine life in the Middle Ages during the winter months. 
we envision something like you see here, something, a picturesque scenery of castles blanketed in snow, people clothed in their favorite furs next to a warm fire, possibly sipping a goblet of mold brew. Yes, it's picturesque. Yes, it's romantic. Um, and for many of us, it's the whole reason we do the SCA. But the truth is, is that goblet of warmth that person is drinking is more than just sheer merriment. Um, speaking from experience, I live on a farm. I have 52 chickens, nine rabbits, three cats, a dog, and I think a partridge in a pear tree. I'm not sure on that one, don't quote me. And by the time I get done taking care of the chickens and everyone else, I'm a block of ice. Coming inside helps a little bit. Wearing warm clothing helps a little bit. But to get really warm, there's nothing better than a warmed bed beverage. And this is kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do this workshop, other than to kind of give people some ideas on some cool gifts to give. Every single one of these, I have a tendency to drink on a nightly basis because I live in Northern Ohio and I have 52 chickens. I'm very cold. So some of the ones of the beverages that we're gonna cover tonight are gonna be wassail, lamb's wool and cudgels, which are all grouped together. We have buttered beer and we have hypocris, which is my personal favorite. All of the drinks we'll be covering today were actually drunk warm, though many taste just as good chilled as well. Um, in terms of cold beverages, I do wanna mention eggnog real quick. I love eggnog, everyone that I know almost loves eggnog. I have a few that aren't a big fan, but it is not a medieval recipe. It was invented in the 1700s. However, if you like eggnogs, yours a good chance you're going to like those cudgels because they are a cousin and the predecessor to it. Now, if you do like um, eggnog and you would like a period recipe, the closest one to the earliest ones that I've been able to find is from Martha Washington's Book of Cookery, and it has an excellent, get it, eggnog, um, sack uh, drink that is essentially um, an eggnog forerunner. It has 14 egg yolks, seven, eight whites, a pint of heavy cream, a half a pound of sugar, all sorts of spices, and it's going to put weight on your bones and help you keep warm during the winter months. Um, you didn't mention any alcohol in that, though. <laughs> well, okay, so to, to take it back, it does have alcohol because it is a sack posset, and a sack means that it has red wine in it. Yes. So, sorry, I jumped on that one a little bit because <laughs> it was post-period. So, you might not have heard of some of these definitions before, so I just wanted to go ahead and throw those up. I'm also one that if I put words up there, I'm not going to read them because I feel like everyone has the ability to do that. Um, other people might have a little bit of different definitions. These are just the ones that I'm using and I've used in my research in the past. I do want to make a note on this that we will not be covering syllabuses because they're cold and I don't like them. No, I'm joking. They're cold and they're not necessarily a beverage as much as something that they would give to someone who was feeling sick. Um, so all of, oops, well, I don't know how to go backwards, so I'm not going to worry about it. So all of the drinks we'll be discussing today will fall into those categories, though we will mostly be focusing on the wassail, the cudgels, and the hypocrisies. Um, probably the most familiar of these to people is going to be the wassail, which is sometimes called lamb's wool because... Uh, sorry, Cadigan is called lamb's wool. I went ahead and I threw up one of these references. Wassel definitely is a period recipe. And like I said, almost everyone knows of it because of the Christmas Carol. Um, when it comes to the term wassail, I actually prefer the term lamb's wool, which is the same name. Um, and it's an ale that is warmed and the foam on top looks like a fluffy ball of wool. And so that's how it got its name. The reason I prefer this term is wassail can also mean to drink. 
So I'm going to wassail. It could also be a toast, especially if you're Anglo-Saxon or earlier, as I see Oswin nodding at me because he's Anglo-Saxon. Um, <laughs> when it is a toast, it means to be hail or be healthy. And by the time the Victorian era happened and the song came out, it also is a verb to go wassailing. So it gets a little confusing. I just like to use the term lamb's wool because of that. And also it sounds really nifty. What are you drinking? I'm drinking some lamb's wool. What are you drinking? Um, this is my modern day recipe. And like I said, I'll make sure that Oswin will be able to go ahead and throw up all of um, these notes and these recipes and everything like that. Um, it's really simple. Basically, you take the baked apple um, and normally bake it for about 20 minutes. I like to cut it in half, remove the seeds. I forgot to put that in there. I will make sure to add that to there. Um, wow, and this is where my recipes slightly differ some, from some other modern ones, is while that is baking, you wanna take half of your ale to simmer. And you wanna add in your spices and your sugar and cook just long enough to melt the sugar. After that, you wanna go ahead and you wanna remove it from the heat. You wanna add the other half of your, your ale and whatever alcohol of choice, sherry, whiskey, vodka is okay. Rum sometimes is really good. And the reason I recommend you only take the half of your ale to go ahead and boil in the sugar and the spices and everything like that is because I really like alcohol. And if you take the whole thing of ale, um, you're gonna boil out a lot of that alcohol even though you're adding in five shots of alcohol towards the end. Now, even though this says one serving or one beer, I don't recommend drinking this to one person unless you wanna be really warm at the end of the night. I would actually recommend going ahead and splitting this recipe for two people, um, especially because of the five shots. Now, I did promise about gifts. Um, with the lamb's ear, you have a few options. The first is to take and dehydrate your apples or get dehydrated apples um, and add them to a little muslin bag along with your spices and sugar cubes. Don't try to add just your sugar. Sugar cube works a whole lot better. I would then take a small bottle of liquor and attach the seasoning bags with the direction to add it to a warm bottle, a cider or ale. And I told you I was totally prepared for this. When I say a little bottle of alcohol, I mean one of these really cute travel sizes. You can get these at any liquor store and you can actually sometimes get them at grocery stores as well. These, when they are attached to those cute little bags of spices and the sugar make a really fabulous gift. Um, Some questions, or, V. Yes. Uh, so we have a question from, well, I won't necessarily say who, I, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, any particular type of ale that works best? Um, they offered some suggestions, but we'll just let you answer that. We do. And I actually was going to cover that at the very end. Um, a lot of these recipes, they actually, I hate to say it, but the more British beer, the better. Um, the most common one that people are going to be able to have is going to be Newcastle Brown. Um, even though they changed the recipe, it's still going to be a nice brown ale. You do want to stick with an ale. You don't want to do a beer. Okay. You don't want to do an IPA. IPA warm is not your friend. Um, I have done these with stouts and I have done them with porters. They're okay with stouts and porters. I do, however, recommend trying to get a, as British of an ale as possible. And at the very end, I do list a couple of them um, that, are, that work a little bit better than others. Um, if you can't seem to get... Um, like Newcastle, I can't find Newcastle in my area because once again, I live in rural Ohio. Um, so unless I go to a liquor store, I'm not gonna find it. Um, any basic brown ale will work really well. Um, so follow up then, uh, how much is a bottle of ale? I'm assuming you're talking a 12, a standard 12 ounce bottle? Yes, yep. <clears throat> Even though I know some of them will come in bigger bottles, I went off the standard 12 ounce because that's what a majority of people are going to be able to find. Okay. That puts us up to date. 
Okay, um, so another option, what you can do if you don't want to do that little one for gifts is you can actually take your hard liquor of choice. And this is where I recommend either a really cheap sherry or a cheap whiskey. And when I mean cheap whiskey, I mean really cheap whiskey. Um, and create a tonic with the sugar spices and dried apples. So basically you're just gonna take your dried apples, your sugar and your spices, and you're gonna put it in your bottle of cheap whiskey and you're gonna let it sit for a minimum of two weeks. You want it to be able to taste slightly good on its own, but remember the point of this is not for it to be drunk on its own, it is to go ahead and be added to the ale. Um, you can then go ahead and give bottles of that with a little instruction, add a shot of this to warm ale. Um, I've done that one in the past before and people have liked it. The third option is one I've done on a larger scale because I am a brewer and this is for more of those people that have been brewing and have this option. I've taken a gallon of spiced ale. Okay, for me it was five gallons of spiced ale. And I added the spices and the sugar along with the whiskey straight into that five gallon carboy. I let it sit for about a week and then I went ahead and bottled it. Now, this ages incredibly well. I didn't think I was gonna be able to say that. I made that recipe about five years ago and I found one of those bottles over Thanksgiving and I decided to go ahead and open it thinking it was going to be really bad and it was gonna go into my turkey. It did not go into my turkey, it went into my stomach. So um, the key is, is you do wanna make sure that you add in the whiskey before you bottle it, if you're gonna go that route. So up next, sticking with the ideas of warm ale and cider is that of a cajal, which is a warm ale, cider, or wine mixed with eggs, sugar, and spices. So the difference between this and the lamb's ear is you're throwing in eggs. Don't fear the eggs. And I'm not saying this because I have 52 chickens and I want to gift you all eggs because I really do. That's not why I'm saying it. It's actually really good. Um, what it does is that egg yolk, and you're only using the egg yolk portion, it adds the nice level of fat and depth and warmth to the beverage that would have been greatly needed for those who are cold in the Middle Ages. These are even especially awesome for people who go to Gulf Wars or something like that, where it is really cold out. To have that extra level of fat with that egg in there is fabulous. There are numerous hundreds of cajal recipes out there. My being, my favorite being this one here that I have listed. Um, and they were so popular, I actually had Lent versions because you could not have egg during the Lent. And so they went ahead and they had almond cajals and they had other ones where they would go ahead and almost use like a wheat instead to get that thickness. Most of these times, these references only were during Lent, though. Um, the trick with the cajals is experiment to your personal taste with the number of eggs that work for you and learning to taper the egg yolks so they don't curdle in your milk. And, I, um, and for anyone who has any experience, um, cooking, I will use the term tapering quite a bit talking about these eggs and what it basically means is you take your warm liquid and you have your egg mixture and you slowly add a little bit of your warm into your egg, you stir it up to warm that up. You do that again till you get that warmer and then you can slowly add that to the rest of your warm. It takes a little bit of time and for someone like me who has doesn't have necessarily the best patience, it's a little difficult, but once you get it, it's well worth it. Um, let me find where I was. Um, the reason I like this recipe is because you actually add in some of the ale or wine into the egg yolks, which makes it a little bit easier to taper them. You're not taking just the egg yolks straight into a hot liquid. I found by doing this method, you're less likely to get scrambled eggs in a beer, which no one wants to enjoy. Um, like I said, you can also do this with wine. I prefer it with ale. Um, I have warmed wine for other things a little bit later. Um, 
you do want to go ahead and add in a little bit of the sugar to taste. Almost all of the, re uh, the recipes do mention saffron and you do want a dash of salt. Um, the salt in it just kind of helps balances it and it brings all the flavors together. I know a lot of people have tried leaving out the salt. I do not recommend leaving out the salt on it. And when I mean a pinch, I mean just a pinch. Um, this one is a little bit more difficult to go ahead and gift. This is one that you're more likely to drink at a party or to have, like I said, at a cold event, or like I said, when I come in after I collect all of those eggs, I go ahead and I've actually made this a couple of times to help warm me up, especially while I'm waiting for dinner to happen. However, you can do an instant codule in a tea bag. And um, I had to go to my brother-in-law, thank you, Greg, to help me create this recipe. Um, he is actually a chef. And so he was the one who tested it for me and it works really well. Instead of using the actual egg yolk, you're gonna use one teaspoon of agar powder or rice flour. When I tried them, I liked the rice flour a little bit better. And what that does is when you heat that up, um, the instructions with it is not to heat up your ale first and then dunk it in like a regular tea. You're actually gonna go ahead and take the little bag or just this mixture, put it in, once again, um, one pint of beer, and then go ahead and heat that up. If, by mixing it in there first and then heating it up, it gives you almost the same effect as going ahead and using the egg. So it is kind of fun gift that you could go ahead and put together in a little mixture and mail off to someone with instructions, hey, here, have a little medieval beverage on me. Um, before we jump off of cajoles, I do want to point out that buttered beers are historically accurate. And for those who do know me are, are laughing at this because I am the biggest Harry Potter and Hufflepuff fan. Surprisingly, I don't have the Hufflepuff mug behind me. Uh, to make it a mild beer or ale was boiled with some butter, sugar, nutmeg and other spices and then was once again thickened with a beaten egg or egg yolk. I went ahead and I put the medieval version down there. And then um, following up on that is my personal recipe that I use. And um, once again, you're gonna heat half the ale and the spices to a boil. Now, if you're doing this for kids, um, and you want, or someone who doesn't want alcohol, you can go ahead and heat the whole amount of ale there. I just like to go ahead and only do half the amount of ale because I do want to try to keep a little bit more of the alcohol and I don't want to boil it all out. The really cool thing with this recipe is, um, if you actually let it cool, it'll get the consistency of a milkshake <clears throat> when you're done and it's all frothy. If you don't drink it right away, which is kind of hard to do, if you put it in the refrigerator and chill it, actually add milk with it and it makes a really fabulous milkshake. And it makes a, a, a cold version of buttered beer. So for anyone who's out there who is also a Harry Potter fan, I did need to go ahead and throw that one in there. This one, because of the butter, I have not been able to figure out how to do it as a gift yet, but I'm working on it. So, <clears throat> Last but not least is my personal favorite. Um, that's a hippocras. And a hippocras is a wine mixed with sugar and spices, usually including cinnamon and, and uh, nutmeg and a few others. And it's almost always heated. And in fact, I'm actually gonna bring one of my bottles over here. Um, the, Hipp the Hippocras and period goes all the way back down to the Roman time period. In fact, I went ahead and I put one of the Roman recipes that I have. I have actually done this exact recipe before. I want to point out on this, if anyone does want to try to the Roman version, and it is very tasty, um, when it talks about the charcoal at the end, that's to help clarify. If you don't care how cloudy it is, just totally skip the charcoal part. Um, this is also one of my very favorite things to gift and I'll explain to you in one second. Hold on. Okay, I totally lost my place. There we are, okay. Before you roll, there's a quick question, which I also had. Uh, what's the exact 
modern equivalent of a Sistari? Oh, I knew you. I knew someone was going to ask that. Um, I basically have to, just now a, a ratio, six parts honey is. to two parts wine. It is. And that's whenever I do my recipes, that's the way I break it down. But for those people who do want to know, I'll go ahead and I'll make sure to put that in the end of these, these notes because I do have a chart on Google um, in my Google Sheets. I have a chart of the breakdown of all medieval measurements because I can't remember them all. Um, so I've tried, I've given up trying that. Any other questions? Uh, nothing that's directly to this yet. So you're good, okay. continue. All right, <clears throat> so knowing that it goes all the way back to the Roman time period. And once again, it is, there's so many references that we can list from uh, for spiced wine drinks, especially ones that are warm. Um, a lot of them are very, very similar. I went ahead and I posted just a couple here because it was nice and easy. <clears throat> when it comes to them, I highly recommend play with your spices, your wine and your sugar content to make something that you enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy it, you're not gonna enjoy making it. For those uh, that are first starting out, a good starting point is one tablespoon of your spice mixture to whatever spice mixture you want to do. I'm a big fan of ginger and cardamom. I leave out nutmeg at all times because I'm allergic. I'll mention that again later on. Oswin once again is shaking his head. Um, so one tablespoon of your spice mixture to one cup sugar to a quart of wine. I actually have a jar of this um, that I keep of the spice sugar that I keep in my kitchen. So if I have a bottle of cheap wine that has been open a little bit longer than maybe it should be and I didn't finish it right away and it's starting to not taste so great, I can go ahead and I can warm it up and I can put the spice mixture in there. Now, here's a little hint. If you don't wanna make your own, if you go to Arwen Spices, Auntie Arwen Spices, and you get her Turkish coffee sugar mixture that also tastes really fabulous in a warm glass of wine, just letting people know. Now, I can actually see people laughing at me and giving me the side eye on the not finishing the bottle of wine. So I'm glad I added in this next paragraph. Don't judge me about adding weird things to the wine. It's actually a very period and medieval thing to do. Um, in fact, the idea of taking a whole tea bag filled with sugar and spices uh, was something that went back as far back I can date to the 13th century. It was not unheard of for people to carry those bags with them to different feasts and dinner tables. And it was not an insult to the person who was throwing the dinner to be able to just go ahead and reach in your thing, pull out your bag and top, put it into your wine glass. This is a lovely tradition to start up. I've done it personally at feasts. I've done it at events and wars and other places when I have gotten some meat that is not so great works fabulous for that. Um, I would love to see more and more people do this. This would be something that I would love to become an SCA tradition because it is a medieval tradition. Um, these little bags were filled with crushed, not powdered. That's a big thing. Don't put powdered cinnamon in there. Put some crushed up pieces of cinnamon stick in there. Spices and sugar cubes are also a lovely gift and are something that could be fit in and mailed. In fact, a lot of my friends will be getting that for Christmas. Um, in fact, I think, there we go. I put my spiced sugar mixture up there. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that you can do is you can do a liquid version, sort of like we talked about beforehand, um, like the Wassell instructions mentioned earlier, you take a hard liquid, a liquor, in this case, I, let me try that again. <clears throat> Hold on, let me drink. Drink break. Take a hard liquor. In this case, I recommend a vodka, a rum, or even a brandy. And for every two cups of vodka, you wanna add in one cup of sugar and one tablespoon of your favorite spices. For the brandy, drop the sugar down to one cup or less and let sit for two weeks. You can then strain and bottle them with instructions to add a shot of the mixture into one glass of warmed wine. 
I do this all the time. <clears throat> and I'll actually take it one step farther that goes into the next recipe. Um, and for anyone who likes sangria and who cans, this is also a really great way to make instant sangria, which is another gift that I will be sending out to a lot of friends. Um, Oswin, close your ears on that one. Um, where this is uh, fruit that has been soaking in brandy and sugar and spices since the summer, and it has been canned. So it will not go ahead and continue to ferment. It's, it's safe. I have a, a pressure canner. And so I'll send these guys out and one of these will make an entire huge pitcher of sangria and they're really fabulous. You can do the same thing with these spice wines. And that's what I have here where I've sent out before. This one was a rum base um, with thyme, sugar and vodka. Um, it's running about 24% alcohol for anyone who's curious. It's also quite a few years old. I'm really impressed that it's actually this clear still, but this added to a white wine is really phenomenal. And because of the lemon thyme, it heats up really nice. Now you can also do a hypocrite straight from the bottle and you can use, do it using commercial wine, which I'll talk about here in one second as well. And you want two parts wine to one part sugar to one part vodka. So that means for every two cups of wine, you wanna do one cup of sugar and one cup of vodka. You wanna go ahead and on this one, this was, I used a pino gris um, and my spices were coriander, ginger, mace, cloves, and cinnamon. The key is if you're gonna do this, um, you're gonna take half of your wine and you're gonna put it into, into a crock pot with your sugar and your seasoning. You wanna cook it on warm for four to eight hours and remove from heat. And when cooling, add in the other part of the wine and the vodka. Like I said, you could also use rum um, on, or brandy on this one as well. Don't use tequila, that would be vile. Um, once cool, you can bottle cork and wax. And I'll talk about the, the corking and waxing in a second, or you can get these really cool corks that already have the top on them, which you can get those off Amazon or from any brewing store. Because of the high amount of vodka to the rest of the ingredients in there, this bottle is six or seven years old um, and it has not gone bad and it won't go to vinegar because of the amount of the vodka in there. So you can take basically this and I even have instructions on the bottle, take a glass, heat it up and enjoy. And you can on your spice wines do white or red. I prefer red only because I prefer red in real life. I got some questions um, when you get the chance. <clears throat> perfect. Um, so actually the first is less of a question, more of a comment that a sectari is basically one sixth of a pint is uh, what someone has said. Awesome. <clears throat> um, question asking, how close is um, glue wine, I guess? I'm, uh, I'm not good with German. G-L-U-H vine, is that how similar to a to Hippocrates is that? I don't know if that one's ringing a bell, but I can figure it out and I can check my German books and I can get back to them. Okay. And I can also see if I have a recipe for it too. Um, that's that's my know. question and it's right there. Ooh, ooh, bring the color. Okay, so it's a commercial spiced wine basically. Yeah, and you can only get it at Christmas time. So spiced wines for the majority of time, they are, there's a whole, there's a whole reason why that, and that's a whole class in itself on why that they would spice wines. And there's some people believe that they would do it in order because the wine was going bad. Other people believed that it balanced their humors, um, but you will actually see more of the spice wines around the winter time because of the whole, it tastes really awesome warmed up. Mold wine is amazing. It really is. Um, I see everyone shaking their head right now. It, it really is fabulous. Um, I personally, when I mold my wine, and that's why I'm a big fan of the ones um, like the, 
the second one I have here, the Hippogriff liquor to be added to warm wine, or when I do my bottle, I will go ahead and I will add additional liquor to it, which I'm assuming that that bottle probably does have a higher alcohol content because anytime they do that, they try to do it in order to make sure that when you warm it up, you don't lose all your alcohol. I know that kind of makes me sound like a boozy and a lush head right now, but it's not. Um, there is, from the medieval perspective, they believed that the warm liquids would go ahead and heat up the firmness of your stomach. And once again, that gets into whole humors and which I love to talk about. And Oz one's like, don't talk about the humors. I'll walk away from the humors. Um, so I do want to talk a little we, we bit. We have more V, sorry. Um, I misspoke. So a sectari is one full pint, not a sixth of a pint. Uh, I like so, a full pint. Um, but another relevant question, documentation for bring your own spices. Do you have that? Some Someone's curious. I do. I actually <laughs> do. Um, and I don't have the book in front of me, but I can go ahead and I can pull it out. Interestingly enough, Oswin, that was the same book that you needed that recipe on oh, the line. Okay. So I will go ahead and pull it out. Um, oh. I am sharing my screen right now, so I don't want to go to my Google nope, Drive. Don't worry about it. Yep. But I will um, go ahead and I will include the name. Um, I also have a, a recipe for the original fig and red wine one that they would go ahead and they would use it for. And I have images of the original manuscript, not in English. So for whoever wants that, I am so happy to share with people if it means that people will do tea bags in their wine at feast. Um, so last two are related um, and just make sure I hook them correctly. Um, how well does this keep, which I guess we're talking about the hypocrite syrups or mixtures, and then do we need to refrigerate what we're not using? Depending on your alcohol content. So this is where the brewer in me is gonna go. I just opened it. <clears throat> For what you're For talking most... about, I mean, those syrups have a lot of vodka. You don't need to refrigerate that. Nope. <laughs> wow, that is really well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, whoever wanted that other documentation, this um, it, recipe is also in with that documentation, and that turned out really, really well. Okay, so I'm making that one again. Um, no, because of the high amount of liquor and because you are not adding any fresh fruit or anything like that, you're sticking specifically with um, spices and sugar, It's there's nothing in there that's going to give it any meat in order to go ahead and start re-fermenting. And this is where I'm actually really glad that my partner in crime is here with me to correct me on this next statement. Once again, because of the high level of alcohol, it, there's no chance of the wine actually going into vinegar. Yeah, and the sugar will interfere with that too. Yeah, so that's, I know on some of the previous recipes, it looked like I was saying a lot of vodka. I am saying a lot of vodka, but that's in order to act as a preserving agent. Um, and the sugar will help go ahead and mellow out the taste of the vodka as well. All right, we're caught up. Okay, awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about the gifting because I did want to make sure to cover that. Um, and also I mentioned for the person who was looking for additional beers and stuff like that, that would do well. There's a whole bunch. I personally have done it with the Newcastle Brown Ale and the Smith's Nut Brown Ale. And then um, Brown, I've done it with Homebrew Brown Ale. I've also done it with really bad homebrew brown ale that wasn't mine um and the spices really helped and the whiskey really helped too um but jumping back up to the top um i want to talk about bottles for a second reusing wine bottles and beer bottles but not a twist off um, or purchasing glass bottles my favorite places are hobby lobby or the dollar store are usually your best option for getting um the bottles do not reuse corks you can purchase corks of various sizes online. Even at Amazon, you can get everything from the tiny corks all the way up to the big ones. Or you can just stop into your local brew store and get some to fit almost any size of bottle. 
I do recommend the artificial cork over the real cork um, as it will last longer. It's less likely to go bad. For those people who are not brewers, to get the cork in the bottle, you're actually gonna go ahead and um, you're gonna heat it up a little bit in warm water, which makes it malleable. And then you're gonna be able to push it in. Now we as brewers have really cool tools to help us with that. I've also done it by hand. Um, and sometimes a little mallet will help. That's if I'm doing one or two. Um, otherwise, I highly recommend if you're gonna do like 50 to go ahead and spend the $7 on a cool little tool, which I don't know if I have one over here. All of my brewing stuff is now in the basement. Yay. Um, the other thing I do wanna talk about though, is as an added look um, and also as an added level of protection, especially if you are not used to corking things, I recommend putting a little bit of a wax top on. It looks really cool. Um, it adds a little, ooh, they wax the top. It's really cheap to do. Um, and it actually adds another layer of protection just in case something goes wrong and your cork maybe might've been slightly the wrong size or something like that. It'll add just a little bit more protection. Um, for anything that you do need to keep sealed. This was a meat. Um, for anyone who cares, if they want to do co fun colors, dollar store crayons and dollar store $1 white candles are your friends. I'm also really cheap. I don't know if people have caught up to that yet. The dollar store is my friend. That probably um, answers the question of why not swing top bottles. Ooh. <clears throat> I know my answer. Go ahead, give yours. Do you, hold on, let me... No, Give me one second. Go ahead. You give your answer. My answer is because they're expensive. <laughs> Swing top bottles are great, but unless well, you're unless you're buying the beer in it, usually they're expensive. So swing top bottles, and I am lucky um because I have been able to find swing top at the dollar store before. Yay! I also probably have a million in my basement right now. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> Um, anyone who's in the Middle Kingdom knows why. Um, <laughs> the problem with swing top is people give them too much credit. They think that they're going to be perfect and they're not. Um, sometimes like this one had a really good seal. I can hear, hear it. Um, but the little, for anyone who can see, here's a little swing top that I just started to open. This little rubber seal a lot of times will actually go ahead and it'll dry out. And if that happens, like if you get used um, uh, swing tops, I always, or even brand new ones, especially the swing tops from the dollar store because you get the really pretty glass ones. I actually have, you can go on Amazon and you can buy like a hundred of these for a couple of dollars. They're not that expensive. I will go ahead and I will replace them brand new every single time. I'm just not a big fan of them because I have had too many where I've forgotten about a brew. I don't even know how old this one is. Um, and I've opened it and that little seal, there was nothing wrong with the, the beverage, but that failed. And so it went bad. Now for a lot of these, this is not that big of a deal because once again, it has such a high alcohol content nothing is really going to go bad on it but that's the only reason i don't recommend the swing tops from a brewing perspective i actually give all my swing tops <clears throat> to my non-alcoholic brewer because she's keeping things in them a lot less of a time than i do for those that don't know or have never been to the drunken duck um, we do mid rum events. We also do Gulf Wars. We've tried doing Pensick. It didn't work so well, mostly because all of us are so busy, but at any given time, when we did the bar at society 50th year, we went through Oswin, help me out 250 gallons, something like that. In that we ballpark. Go, yeah. Yeah. We go through mass amounts of alcohol. I currently have 75 <laughs> gallons sitting in my library that needs to be bottled. Um, and so we go through a lot of mounts and because it's all donations from everyone across our kingdom, I mean, we have tons of people donate and they always get credit for it. That's the biggest deal. Um, there's some times that I might have someone's bottle for five or six years before it finally gets opened. And so with swing tops, that's just always hit and miss. So there's my little tangent on swing tops. 
Okay, so we have some questions <clears throat> about the kinds of wine, uh, I guess varietals, uh, you would use in a hypocrist. Looks like two or three questions that are related. Do you want to? Do are on? they all along that same thing? Uh, one was what kind of wines are good to use with a hippocras and to blend with your spices. Of course, that's going to depend. And then um, I was mulling over some wines to use with this. You mentioned Mulling. table red I... versus rosé. So they're basically the same question. OK, so I'm not a big fan I of rosé. I intended my lady. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was awesome. Huge points on that one. Um, I'm not a big fan of rosés from a Hippocrat's point of view because it's not quite a white, it's not quite a red. So as long as you pick delicate um, spices and you enjoy drinking a rosé, then you're good to go. Historically speaking, almost for the majority of the part, um, I'm going to give you the historical answer first. Pinos, uh, greases, anything that would have been a more of a historical, think of an Italian or a German wine, something like that. Those are going to be the ones that you're going to actually have more of the historical ones. Now, forget all about that. You choose what you like to drink. I like Merlots because I think they're really easy to blend with the majority of different um, spices and sugars and stuff like that. I, I have a tendency to stay away from the Moscatos on the whites and I'll go for um, Pino Noirs on the whites. And I'm really, really glad that someone asked this question. Oh, what about Shiraz? Shiraz, oh, fabulous. Now the thing with Shiraz are, Shirazes are a tiny bit on the spicier side. so. I personally would up the sugar content a little bit on that, but I would also play off that spiciness and I would go ahead and I would put like long pepper in there. I'd put a little bit of German in the uh, German. Yes, they don't hold German in the bottle. Ginger small in one. there. Yeah, small German. <laughs> um, I would play off that spiciness. And when I labeled it, I would go ahead and I would send out the fact of that it is a spicy, you know, to add heat to the body and it will, and it'll be fabulous. Um, don't hesitate. And I know that there was a reference in the earlier recipe. Um, if it says pepper, it does not mean cayenne pepper. It means like regular pepper, black pepper, white pepper, long pepper, tons of peppers. Don't in brewing, never ever uh, be scared of pepper. Pepper is your friend. Um, they really are. Peppercorns are an amazing ingredient to brew with, and they taste really great in red wines. I would not use peppercorns necessarily in the white wines. That's when I would do more of the lemon times. I would do more, once again, the gingers. I would do the softer ones. Um, I would definitely do cardamom in your, in your white wines. And I know I have it listed on here on this PowerPoint, the cheaper, the better. This is not the time to be pulling out your 15, your 25, your 35. We're gonna stop there because I don't have that many more that are above that. I have a few, but not very many. We're talking your two buck chucks. We're talking your Walmart 399s, your Winking Owls, your Aldi's. Um, in fact, I had this because I was using that as an example earlier. The California Merlot um, from Walmart Actually, Winking Owl, I think, is Aldi's. I might have confused those two, but it doesn't matter. Oh, it's Winking Owl, it's Aldi's. So he's $3.99. Walmart is cheaper. Um, he is fabulous if you add in dried plums, dried raisins, anything like that. The cheaper, the better. It really does. Because once you heat, heat up the wine a little bit and you get that mold, it's going to take off any of that bite that comes from a cheap wine. Um, and no one is going to know the difference. And I can tell you this because I was born in uh, the foothills of California, Nevada, and my mom is a wine snob. And I've made her this and she has loved it. I hope she never sees this because she doesn't need to know that I'm giving her Walmart $2.99 bottles of wine. Um, uh, quick question, <laughs> grains in wine. Grains okay. in white wine, specifically. <laughs> Let me unpack that for you, Verena. I mean, oh, grains. Thanks, okay. you mean, you mean what? Grains of paradise. Oh, yes. Oh, I didn't know what you meant. Yes. Grains of paradise. Yes. So the reason <laughs> why, and you probably saw the brain going that you, if you actually go 
if we go back and we take a cudgel and you have the egg in there and everything like that, and you actually put in either gruel or wheat or grains or even a bread, a piece of sop or bread on top, um, that was a very medieval beverage. So I was going to start going into talking about like the wheats and the barleys you can throw in there. You can talk but about that too. The problem with those and molding, not molding, but molding, um, is that they, you're not going to be able to get any really great flavor profiles out of them. You could possibly try to do it from a, from a white wine perspective, or maybe some of the malted grains in the red wines. I, other than them doing it right away and ingesting the wheat and the grains, I don't have any references where they would strain it out. Now, just because I don't have the reference doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, but I would recommend staying, especially for a long-term thing, if this is gonna be something you gift or something you're gonna store or lose in your basement, um, I definitely would stick with more of the spices because those will last longer. But Grains of Paradise, totally your friend in both red and white. Next question. Nope, we're good. Okay, awesome. So um, for those that know me know that I have to talk about this. Um, after the bottles is labels, labels, labels. Um, I have so many bottles that people are awesome and they donate and they don't put their names on their bottles. Um, I'm also going to tell a really horrible story. We lost one of probably in the mid realms, best brewers that I think we've ever seen. Um, great, great friend, his wife contacted me, had me pick up all of his stuff, including the 75 gallons and, um, and cases upon cases, we filled a 12 foot trailer of bottles that are tasty, but not labeled. So I tell everyone, I don't care if it's for you. Thank you. Yes. Labels. I don't care if it's for you, if it's for gifting, if you're sharing it or what, please label everything. Labels are your friends. When you label, please include your ingredients. Um, this is when I hearkened back earlier that um, I am allergic to nutmeg. And if you go ahead and give me a taste of one of these amazing beverages that you're going to brew because you're going to be inspired and you want to go ahead and drink some mold wine and you want to give me one of your tea bags so I can try your recipe. Please let me know if it has nutmeg in it. If it does, I'll take my medicine. We're all good to go and I'll taste your wonderful brew. If I taste it and I do always read the ingredient labels, if I taste it without any labels on it or without knowing it's nutmeg, I'm going to have a really horrible night it's not gonna be pleasant. Um, so please make sure you label it and also label it with your name so you get credit. Um, that's a big thing with us at the Drunken Duck is we wanna make sure all of our brewers get proper credit and put the date on it. Um, mostly because none of these items are going to go bad. They're not, but it's good to know, hey, I made this five, six, 10 years ago. Um, Along with that, this is going out to some of our new brewers out there or who have not brewed yet, because like I said, this is definitely a gateway into brewing, is if you're going to do any of these recipes, please start a brew journal. And I don't care if this is whatever you make for the holidays is the one recipe and it sits in there by itself for a year or two years or three years. It doesn't matter, but start a brew journal. Um, I wish that was the one piece of advice someone gave me back when I made my very first liqueur. Um, luckily, I had someone tell me pretty closely afterwards um, and gave me a, a just a plain cheap journal. I know some people do it um, online and keep it going in a notepad. Um, I go to the dollar store and I get their little journals and I fill them up and then I date them. And when they're full, I move on to the next one. Um, we already covered the wine, the cheaper, the better, the ales. Once again, um, I wish this was one of those occasions where I could say the cheaper is the better. It's not necessarily. Though, what is that cheap American brown ale that has its orange and brown colored and it has like a picture of a little orange barrel? It's really, really cheap for a six pack. If anyone knows, help me out here or not. Anyways, you can get that at Walmart. I've actually done some of these with that. It actually does okay. 
Um, the thing is, is you don't want to use a lager. You don't want to use an American beer. You don't want to use um, uh, an IPA. For some reason, when you warm those up, they just don't do as well. So I highly recommend sticking with more of the British or the brown ales and stuff like that. And a red ale will actually do fairly well. Um, we have some commentary here real quick too. I want to okay. throw in there. Labeling, um, first of all, said bottling date. Yes, important. Uh, yes. Include yeah. that. Um, someone's mentioned include whether you're sulfated, um, sulfited. Um, yes, because that's uh, can be a trigger for people. I would throw yeah. in if you're brewing, not if not if you're mixing. Mixing, you have to figure it out by math. But if you're brewing, uh, include your ABV. Yes, um, please. Some people need to know. This is going to put me on the floor, and I'd like to know that beforehand. Um, Odette asked if you meant uh, honey brown for the beer. Yes, thank you. That would be the one. Honey brown. Um, honey brown is the only American one that I would actually recommend with good. Um, I've used it before. It's done okay. I actually did it for a feast. Um, one of the things on the sulfites, I do want to take a step back for that just as an fyi unless you get sulfite free wine that is chemically had the sulfites removed all wines do actually have sulfites in them so if if that is something like you're gifting someone that has a sulfite allergy please don't do one of the wine recipes do one of the ones um that they can add to either an ale or any of the ones that I have listed that have the ales on there, they also went ahead and they did make reference that you can use cider. I'm actually gonna ask Oswin to help me out a little bit with this one because his knowledge of cider brands is a little bit better than mine. I would say if you are going to use a cider for any of those recipes, stay away from things like cider boys that are overly sweet and artificially done. Now, I love cider boys, but you'd want more of a uh, English cider, such yeah. as Oswin. English cider is that like Woodchuck? Uh, it's hard to. Th some of the commercial people do make English style ciders, um, and so those are going to be better, especially if they're more East Country style. They'll be drier and less cloudy. Um, Stay away from French ciders. They tend to be low ABV and, and sweet. Mm -hmm. um, you, and you don't want a sweet cider yeah. if you're going to use the cider for you. If you can get, you can get English ciders from some of your local uh, Friar Tucks or Benny's or whatever major uh, alcohol distributor store you may have. Aspal is a brand that makes a very dry cider. Um, that would be good for mulling with. But it, it's it's seven dollars a bottle, so you better really like it. <laughs> um, when it comes to um, well, that'll the, work. the spiced wines and stuff like that, you can almost every single one of those recipes you can go ahead and you can do in a mead instead. If you do do a mead, um, first of all, try your mead first. If it is a sweet mead, take down the amount of sugar. Also, add in a, a touch of salt. If it is a dry mead, then treat it just like you would a white wine. Um, or if it is a honey-based white wine, which I guess is available now from a lot of local grocery stores, treat it like you would a white wine, but just taste it first. If it's really overly sweet, you don't want to add in too much sugar. No one wants to drink cough syrup. They just really don't. Um, somehow I timed it just perfect because we are just at the uh, one hour mark. For those who are asking, um, I will go ahead and not tonight, because um, I do have some farm chores left to do tonight and eat. Um, I will go ahead and get my PowerPoint and some of my notes and recipes for these up on our website, thedruckanduck.org. I will also go ahead probably this next week, do a poster day or two um, on our Facebook page. So just basically look for a drunken duck Facebook page. There's a few of us. Um, so look for the one that looks like it's a little bit more SCA medieval. Um, I think the current picture is a duck in the shape of a wine glass, I think. 
um, but we will go ahead and we'll put recipes, notes, and examples up there. Or like I said, join our Mid Realm Brewers group. It's a great group to be part of. And um, you can feel free to ask all sorts of questions in there as well. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen if I can. There's, oh look, there's a stop share button. So if anyone has any additional questions, feel free, ask away. Oh, and thank you for the person who said it was interesting that made my day because I was totally worried about this. You've had several um, of those as people have had to bow out. So you're good, you're doing oh. great. Um, we um, will be doing um, some ones coming up in the new year. Um, if anyone has any suggestions that they would like to see, I would like to aim them more towards the beginning brewers. Um, we do also have brewing competitions in the Mid-Realm Brewing Group. It is not just open to Mid-Realm Brewers on some of them. Um, and that's some of the ways that we're going to try to keep the medieval brewing going while we're all in quarantine and we're all staying safe and wine kills germs and it makes us happy um, and healthy. So I, I say cheers to everybody. And um, if anyone has any additional questions, friend me on Facebook, ask away or send your questions to the drunken duck. If I don't answer them, Oswin will. Uh, Percival would like to share a bit if you are okay with him unmuting. Go for it. Hi, I'm Percival. Um, Barony of the Steps Brewing Champion and um, in Anstiora, I got, you asked about a corker. Yes. Here's the corker. <laughs> it's <Yep>. really cheap. <laughs> Hold on. Um, um, if you're going to cork, this is the thing to have. It, 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 only a couple bottles at a time. Um, this little sweetheart, the cork goes in here, you boil the cork. It's tapered, you can see down in there. And it just goes on the bottle like that. And you get this. Mm -hmm. Why well, could pull a cork from with one of those things? And Same cork puller you, you use with anything. Yeah, it looks, it looks pretty away. powerful, you know? Oh, no, this this bad cool. boy has saved me more time than I want to even think about. These are my absolute favorite gifting bottles. Um, they're the Mexican soda bottles, uh, Sonorio Sangria. They're 330 mil. Oh, you, can either sangria. Cork you can either cork them or you can cap them. Capping, I've used capping a lot on the wine bottles and stuff like that, um, especially on the smaller bottles or I've done wine and mead in the beer bottles and I've capped them. Um, I actually am a fan of those. That seems yeah. to work fairly well. And, and if I, you found, are I found with, with my meads, because um, I like a sweeter mead, I learned from Master Gerald from Calentier. He, he's my squire brother. Um, we're all connected somehow or another. <laughs> I, know, I know Master Gerald. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> okay. Well, he's my squire brother, which means Moon Wolf is my grand squire. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Um, Uncle Biffy. But... Uh, but my meads, they run a little sweet, so I always go with two or three bottles worth. The the 330 mil, the 12-ounce bottles, are probably your best gifting option. And for That's anyone who, if anyone, oh, first of all, yes, thank you. I just, someone said that the Drunken Duck website is down. I'll talk to my web minister tomorrow. We'll get that back up. We are in the middle okay. of doing a redesign. Um, so I'll work on that probably tomorrow night. Um, okay. and also if you do want to end up capping or you want to, uh, put in corks or anything, um, contact your local brewers. I know I have four capping machines and, and now I have gosh knows how many corkers. Um, and I would gladly lend them out to anyone local. I would do a nice safe drop off on their front porch, pick it up, you know, in a couple of days. So if it's something that you want to borrow, just put out a little call to your local brewers or to your local barony or group or whatever and see if anyone has one. Because brewers are some of the nicest, most caring, sharing individuals I know. And nine out of 10 times, they'll help you do it or they'll lend you things and stuff like that. Um, someone said the Drunken Duck Facebook group. Yes, give me one second and I will go ahead and I will put a link to that as well. Okay, good. Because I, I can't seem to find it. It's like, I'm finding like, 
every kind of drunken duck but your drunken duck. I have it up, V. I'll just paste it. You, did you find it? I was, I'm on it. I was looking oh. to see what the, uh, what the cover image was. Oh, it's our sign. Wait, no, it's, oh, it's, it's your mug. I, my mug. No, oh. it's, it's your mug with uh, one of the uh, chalkboard ducks. Um, I do want to make a, a real quick thing, especially for those that um, are new to uh, medieval beverages and stuff like that. You probably saw me drinking out of a, a cool little chalice. Um, this is mold wine is what I'm drinking tonight. And because it is warm, I don't recommend drinking it out of glass. Um, I also don't recommend drinking mold wine and warm beverages out of pewter or the aluminum or the tin or anything like that. They will heat up pretty quickly and they'll burn your hands. So just a fair warning of something that most people don't think of until it's happened to them a couple of times. And um, I support your local potters, especially during this uh, this time is, is really important. I know a lot of them are doing specials and stuff like that. And there are actually two, um, it, for people that want to bring more of these mold beverages to their encampments and stuff like that, there are two brewers that I know, not brewers, potters that I know of that will actually create um, heating ones where you actually will have the cauldron on top and then they have a, a brazier underneath. I've got about five of them in the other room and I won't run and go and get them right now. But um, Tostin's Pottery does it and um, I'm trying to remember uh, the lobster uh, lobster pottery is the other one. And um, one is based out of Canada, one is based out of Calentier. Amazing potters. Um, so yeah, highly recommend those for anyone who wants to start doing this on a regular basis at events and stuff like that. Uh, suggestion of a sake warmer too, which is a good idea. Yeah, sake warmers are our friends. Um, especially when you, I get really cold. I don't know if that has become evident, but especially living in the Midwest, um, I'm constantly cold. And so anything to help keep me warm, my beverage is warm, I'm all for it. I think that's it. All right. Then since we are now done, I am going to end the meeting, which is going to kick all of you out. No offense. It's just the way it works. And well, thank you. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. This will be this up on. Great.